Hey, beautiful friends. Welcome back to another episode of The Robin Graham Show. So for anybody who knows me very well at all, knows that sleep is a very important factor in my life. I love sleep. And if I don't get enough of it, I'm cranky. Nobody wants to be around me. I am that person that literally needs eight hours of sleep every single night, or I start to panic and think I, I'm not even going to be able to function the next day. So a perfect example of this is every year we go, well, not every year, but most, most years we go to Idaho to see our family. My husband's family is all there and we go on a ski trip. But to get from the East Coast to the West Coast, it is always a connecting flight. And we have to leave our house at like 2.30 in the morning. That means if I were going to get enough sleep, I would have to be in bed by just about 6.30 at night, right? And it doesn't happen because I'm a last minute packer and it's always a nightmare. I'm frantically trying to figure out what I want to take. What am I going to want to wear and blah, 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 blah. Inevitably, I pack the completely wrong things. But the long and the short of it is I'm exhausted. It's all I can do to make it to the airport, get on the plane before I'm back asleep. So I am passionate about this topic. And I fully believe that when we prioritize our health, especially sleep and eating right and exercising, we can transform our lives and we can show up better in our business and we can show up better for our families, better in our relationships, just better overall. So today I am bringing on a sleep expert someone who is an expert in biohacking. She is a fitness trainer. She's just an incredible woman. She's a mom of two little ones, which I love to see. Um, so we're going to dive into this topic today. And you guys, I really think it's going to be transformative for you. So if you have been struggling with sleeping, if you have been not getting enough sleep, you're going to have a complete mind sh mindset shift around this com the, the idea of getting enough sleep for your life. All right, without any further ado, Tanessa Shears, welcome to the Robin Graves Show. Hi, Robin. Thank you for having me on. I, I love a good nerd out conversation on sleep and how it impacts our brain and our health. I'm so looking forward to this. Me, me too. Me too. Because, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people too. I always believe there's room for improvement. So as much as I, I try to get the right amount of sleep and, and do the same routine every night and try to be very regimented, I'm sure there's room for improvement. So I'm excited to learn from you. And I've heard you speak before and you give excellent advice and I've listened to your podcast. So we're I'm, I'm super ready to drive in, to dive in. So before we get started, though, will you please tell the listeners just a little bit about you and what brought you to this point in your journey to be a biohacker, biohacker, biohacking expert, whatever you call it. And then a sleep expert as well. Yeah. So my name is Tanessa Shears. I'm a health consultant. I work with entrepreneurs specifically to help them optimize the way their brain works. So we're talking about better focus, thinking clearer, uh, less overwhelm and anxiety, but I also help them optimize their health right? Because don't you notice a lot of the times as entrepreneurs, we get so focused on growing our business that we're like, I just don't have time to exercise this week. Or I I'm grabbing like, give me my, my instant noodles, something quick for me, it was bowl of cereal. That was my go-to for a long time. <laughs> like when you're just in that building and that growth phase and it's taking all of your focus. And then all of a sudden you look around and you're finally got your business up and running and it feels amazing. But you're like, I, when is the last time that I saw a gym or did a workout and that health that is so important in how we feel and our energy gets deprioritized kind of by accident. So my job is to help you put it back on the plate, so to speak, and to make it really easy. And like you were talking about, I do that with biohacking and we'll probably get a little bit into that, but I'm really big on data and numbers because as entrepreneurs, our brains, we work in return on investment. I want to know, let's just take running a Facebook ad is something that most people will understand. Like if you're spending hundred dollars, $200 a day, I want to know that I'm recouping that cost in product sales or service sales. And if I'm not, something needs to change. So I look at health the way we look at business. Meaning if I spend time doing this habit before bed, this thing first thing in the morning, am I seeing a direct result on how my body experiences stress, how I am sleeping, how I am feeling? So it's all about looking at the data and saying, is this worth the time I'm putting into it? Because we're busy. We don't have endless hours in the day to do all these health habits that don't make a difference. So we got to figure out what works for you and then implement. Mm, I love this so much. And, you know, when we talk about this too, 
there's a significant difference in our ability to focus whether or not we feel that afternoon fogginess in our brain and crave sugar or chips or processed foods in the afternoon versus, you know, grabbing a healthy snack. There's so many facets to this that I, it's like, it's like an onion. I mean, you could peel back the layers of, of health and wellness for hours and hours and hours and hours, I think, and never get to the, to the center of it. Right. Yeah, there's definitely so much. There are so many things that you could work on. And I very much, when I originally started the online component of my business in 2017, I was like, four pillars, exercise, food, stress, sleep, we're going to work on them all. But I mean, as I've been doing this for so long, and after collecting a lot of data, I'm just learning that like, no, it's sleep is a foundation which supports everything else. I mean, think about this. You've had a bad sleep. How likely are you to skip your workouts? How irritable are you? How likely are you to show up for your business instead of deciding like, oh my God, I'm just too overwhelmed today. I'm just going to go watch some housewives and skip today. I'll start again tomorrow. Or, you know, you decide that the comfort eating comes in, you're hungrier than usual. You're craving foods that aren't as good for you. Like so much is affected when your sleep is not high quality. So I'm like, no, no, no. We start with sleep and watch how everything else gets easier. So let's, let's start with that. I think this is a really good place to start because I was, I was curious. And before we started recording, we had this conversation, how you start with sleep with your clients and then you bring in food and exercise and the other things, but let's talk about this. What are the complications that result from a lack of sleep? Oh, so many things. Like, first of all, we can just look at the fact that your brain does not physically recover during the night. So there's a really cool process that goes on. If you want to get a little sciencey with it, you have all of this spinal fluid that loves to like give your brain what I call like a brain bath, clear off some metabolites and stuff like that, that accumulates during the day. So, you know, those days where you wake up feeling like really groggy, you likely weren't getting enough of that restorative, that physical brain restorative time, right? And a lot of that happens during deep sleep. But then there's also the other end of the spectrum where we spend a lot of time dreaming and that's where we incorporate mental health, right? Because during that time, we get mental restoration. That is where we get that balance and that check with our emotional state. We're able to, when we have good sleep, I can read facial expressions and body gestures better. I have better out of the box thinking and concentration and problem solving. Like, All of these things factor into our ability to be good entrepreneurs. So if you're waking up, you're foggy, don't feel very creative. You're not going to put out very good content. It takes you twice as long to do. Your stuff's running into the evening. And all of a sudden you're checking your email under the dinner table and you're trying to put out fires. Like you just almost end up in this hypervigilant state because of how foggy your brain is. It's not making good decisions. You're not thinking clearly. So I really like to think as sleep is that place that, has you showing up as the type of human that's going to run a really successful life and business. Mm, I love that. So, okay. So you mentioned a couple of things. One, you, you don't restore your body if you don't have enough sleep. And as a result of that, you're foggy, you don't have energy, your workouts aren't going to be good uh, or as good anyway. They may not be as long. You may not be as strong. You're going to be more likely for injury. I would assume, Mm -hmm. um, And then you, then you have the whole mental health aspect of it where you don't have clarity. You're maybe more confused. You don't have the awareness that you would normally have. Your creativity is lacking. So, okay. So now we have this list of things that can go wrong if we don't have enough sleep. So let's flip that switch. How can we ensure that we do get enough sleep? Oh, this is my favorite question because I stumbled on this by accident. So when I was pregnant with my first daughter, I was like, I'm going to be the fittest pregnant lady that I can be. And I got myself a Fitbit to track all my steps, but nobody quite prepared me for the, the pelvic joint pain that comes with being pregnant. And I was sidelined very quickly, but I was like, so what else does this Fitbit do? And I'm like looking through it and it's like, you're getting six and a half hours of sleep per night. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm going to bed at 11, wake up at seven. Let's do the math. That's eight hours. Like I'm getting good sleep. It's fine. But but what is going on with this Fitbit? I don't understand. And that is when I really understood this concept of like, wait a second. You mean the whole time that we tell ourselves we're sleeping, we're not. And as it turns out, we're actually awake Four different. There's four different opportunities for us to have awake time when we're asleep. 
When you turn off the lights, your brain does not sleep on command. You take a couple minutes to fall asleep. Some of us longer than others. Depends how busy your brain is, right? So that time is called your sleep latency, how long it takes you to fall asleep. Then did you know that we naturally wake up between sleep cycles every 90 to 120 minutes? Most of them we aren't aware of. We've gotten good at putting ourselves back to sleep. Not like my six month old right now, who is very aware when she wakes up between (laughs) sleep cycles and she's like, help me get back to sleep. I haven't learned it yet. Beyond that, there's the times we wake up because of things like a noise in the night, or we have to go to the washroom, or, you know, we get an adrenaline shot because we're overloaded during the day. And then, of course, there's our brain pulling us out of sleep in the morning. So I analyze entrepreneur sleep data. That's what I do as part of my business. And I have been doing this for years. And I can say very clearly that the average entrepreneur is awake between an hour and an hour 15 per night. Now you take your example, most people only give themselves seven hours to sleep and you now say you're awake for an hour 15, you are now getting five hours and 45 minutes. You're not even coming close to the minimum of seven hours. Your brain needs to function properly. But the problem is we look at our friend, we look at our fellow entrepreneur, we look at our family, everyone seems pretty exhausted. So this has got to be normal. And then we never again question if this is normal for us or if we want it to be. Mm, that's interesting. So, okay. Now we know that we're not getting the amount of sleep. Like when you said that, I'm like, Oh, so my eight hours really isn't eight hours. It's only seven hours, but I think I need eight hours. (laughs) And I know like the, I think that what is it? The recommended, the recommended number of hours is seven to nine. So yes. Or is that right? Um, okay. So now how can we I guess we're going to wake up no matter what, right? Like our body just is going to wake up periodically. It it depends on the person, honestly, because like I identify as a very light sleeper. I'm the person who hears everything in the night. So there's definitely things you can do for that. And then as we age, you're naturally more likely to wake up to go to the washroom in the middle of the night. That's a totally normal thing. So it's not like, oh my gosh, there's something wrong. I'm waking up. The question is, Are you waking up once a night or three times a night? And then the next thing is like, are you able to get back to sleep within 15 minutes? Or are you one of those people that takes an hour, two hours to fully get your brain back to sleep? Okay. So what do we do if this, if this is the case, like, is there a routine before we go to bed that will help us stay asleep longer or get back to sleep faster if we do wake up or are there thing what what can we do to change that so that it's not happening so that we actually get that full amount of sleep that we need yeah so i i think i've even i think i just even recently recorded a podcast episode on the 10 different reasons that we wake up at night so first thing is identifying okay why am i waking up right because if you're being woken up because you have a rambunctious cat like i do in the middle of the night, then you're going to want to look at like, okay, well, how can I make my soundscape in my room a little more neutral? So that's where you'd like, maybe I'll try a sound machine, or maybe I'll try earplugs, different strategies like that. If we're waking up in the middle of the night, because we're having to go to the washroom all the time, we're looking at things like, okay, how much water am I drinking and how close to bed? Or I'm looking at things like, am I eating a very, very high carb dinner, which is making my body have to go to the washroom in the middle of the night, right? And then the last big category that we look at is like, are we hypervigilant throughout the day? And I like to categorize this as like, are we being a human being, which is being present and enjoying our life? Or are we only human doings? Human doings are, we go from meeting to task list, to writing posts, to running children over here, to making dinner, to walking... It's to do item after to do it. And we are human doings. And I often find that when we don't find our unique balance between human being and doing, we end up a little hypervigilant. Our cortisol stays higher. We go into our sleep with high cortisol and that ends up waking us up. So if you're one of those people that wake up and your brain like lights up like a Christmas tree and you're just like to-do list, here's what you should have done yesterday. Why did you say that during that conversation? It's very likely that there's just a bit too much time in human doing and we need to really take care of more of the, the mental health side of our life. So those, those nights, which happen probably more than they should, where I have to pull the journal out and take notes <laughs> in the middle of the night because I have this brilliant idea. <laughs> I've yeah. been too hyper, too hyper vigilant during the daytime, I'm guessing. 
Yeah, it's definitely. And then there's a lot of really unique things that happen while we are um, sleeping. And then we're when, can we just pause for a second? Hold on. My toddler's having an So when we wake up in the middle of the night like that, there are things that we can do to help ourselves put ourselves back to sleep. Like, yes, there is definitely the component of being hyper vigilant during the day, but during the night, one of the worst things that we can do is pick up our phones and check the time. There's a whole component that it comes to when we're looking at like, okay, what, what is the time? How many hours do I have to go back to sleep? But what most people don't know is that light that is coming from that phone. It is a spectrum of blue light. And it has been shown that if you look at that phone in the middle of the night, your melatonin, that's the hormone that helps you fall asleep, stay asleep, can drop to near zero. Now, try to get back to sleep when your hormones aren't supporting that. And so one of the first things we always do is we check our phone. So I always like to encourage, like, keep your phone face down. The last thing you're going to want to do is actually look at that device. And then the second thing that we can really do to help is look at our breathing. So there's a really neat thing that happens when we inhale. Did you know that your heart rate speeds up? And when you exhale, your heart rate slows down. And so we can use this to our advantage to help disengage that fight or flight response. So what we can do is it's called the physiological sigh. And it's something that's been really popularized by like a neuroscientist named Andrew Huberman right now. Have you listened to his podcast? Or have you heard of him? No, and I, I haven't, but oh I want God. you to spell, how do you spell this so that I make sure yeah. I get it right? I'm going to Google it and then I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Yeah. Huberman Lab, H-U-B-E-R-M-A-N. He's a neuroscientist out of Stanford, and he has recently taken this whole biohacking brain science sphere by storm, so to speak. And he, uh, his podcasts are, they're very dense and very long, but I like to kind of take the best stuff that he's finding in research. And then of course, test it out on myself, but he has presented this idea that's been in research called the physiological side. Now, if you've ever had a really good cry session, or you've seen a little, a little toddler cry, cry. And at the end they go, <laughs> that's the physiological side as a reflex. Now, how can we use that for us? If we want to slow our heart rate down in the middle of the night, because we are feeling anxious or on edge, I want you to try this. We're going to do a double inhale. The first one is going to be breathing in as much as we can, sneaking in a little extra air with a second breath and a big, long exhale. So it looks like this, you're breathing in. where you're inhaling through the nose as much as you can, sneak in a little more, exhaling through the mouth. We do this two to three times and it begins to lower our heart rate so that we can start engaging with our prefrontal cortex and taking control of our brain again, taking us out of fight or flight. It's a real-time strategy that you can use in the middle of the night. I use it when the baby cries because it sets off a bit of a fight or flight response. That's how I wind down and get back to sleep really quick. Oh, you know what's so funny? So I, I have a Peloton bike, which I love, 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 but Peloton, um, I do uh Kendall tools rides a lot and she starts her rides out doing that breathing exercise every time. That's interesting. I wonder if yeah. she knows it's a physiological sire, if it's just something she's intuitively discovered, you know, I, I don't know it, it, but it made me think of that. Cause that's how she starts every ride with, is with that now, you know, second breath and then hold it a little bit and then big exhale. So it's, it's just funny how there obviously there's some legitimacy to this because yeah I love that I love that it's just science making its way in and like I know because like before I discovered this I was always taught box breathing which is super effective but it also regulates inhale and exhale to be the same amount of time but if you're in fight or flight in the middle of the night and you want to slow your heart rate down and get out of that we want to extend the exhale relative to the inhale mm -hmm. yeah okay that's fascinating so in the phone thing, I think I did know that. And I don't even have my phone by my bed at night. It stays in the bathroom because I, and I have noticed like if, um, if the, say the DVD player or whatever, the direct TV, whatever that box is that we have, um, I don't do the, the t I don't even know how to work our TVs, but the, <laughs> there's this little blue light on it that gets accidentally turned on. And like, I can't sleep if that blue light's there. Like I have to have it no, that does not work for me. So, but it's interesting how, how many people I do know will check their phones and I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't want to know what time it is because then I'm panicked. Oh, I only have two hours left or I only have 
45 minutes left. So I'd rather not know the time so I can just go back right into that deep sleep. Yes, exactly. And then all you end up doing is mental math. And then when you're laying there for another half an hour, you're like, now it's only three hours. So I can go back to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what can we do before we go to bed to help us sleep or even throughout the day? What are some of those things that we can do to make sure that when we hit the pillow at night, we're going to go to sleep and have good sleep, not being hyper vigilant. I mean, we talked a little bit about that, but like, are, should we be taking naps during the day? Would that help us sleep better at night? Like what are the the different things that we could do during the daytime? Okay. So if we start with daytime naps are great, but they're so person dependent. So if you are a napper, which I mean, if I can catch a nap, I love it. My naps are usually anywhere between 10 and 30 minutes at absolute most because what they can actually do is alleviate something called sleep pressure. So when we wake up in the morning, we have very low sleep pressure, right? You're feeling a lot, the most alert when you wake up in the morning. So what happens during the day is there's a a molecule called adenosine that accumulates in our brain. Mm -hmm. And when we sleep, it removes all that adenosine. So what a nap can do is if you have a hard time falling asleep already, having a nap actually makes it harder to fall asleep at night. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have problems falling asleep at night, a nap can be a really good way to have a midday recovery session. But I do like to keep them before 3 p.m. so that they don't interfere with sleep pressure at night. But they also are short enough that they're not fully relieving that sleep pressure regardless. Mm -hmm. So that's something you can do in the day. As far as when we're getting into our evening, one of the most potent stimulators on our brain is light. It gives so much information, not only the color, but the brightness, um, the timing of the light, how high the light is. So I like to take my clients through a process that I call the sunset simulator at night. So think about this. Imagine it's, let's imagine summer, because right now it's winter and there's not much sun where I'm living in Vancouver, Mm -mm. but imagine a nice sunny day. And what happens as the sun begins to set? So the sun gets lower in the sky. It's getting dimmer. The colors are turning to yellows and oranges and pinks, right? It is such a lovely like experience for your brain. And that change in light height, light color and light intensity, tell your brain it's nighttime. We need to start producing melatonin. It's wind down time, turn the cortisol off. Like this is what we want. So that is how biologically we have evolved. And now there's this thing called electricity that we all have which now creates daylight in our house at any time of day. And what we like to do is spend time on our TVs and our computers and our phones until the second we go to sleep. Now, our brain is exceptionally sensitive to the bright blue light that comes off of a screen. And it is telling your brain, it's noon, middle of the day. Don't go to sleep. Don't get ready for sleep. Don't calm down. No melatonin. Cortisol can stay ramped up. And our brains are like, gotcha, it's daytime. And we're on Instagram scrolling right before bed and we turn our phone off, we turn the light off and your brain is like, wait, wait, you want me to sleep now? I need like, I need at least a couple of hours to ramp up these hormones and that's why we have trouble falling asleep. And even if you can fall asleep because you're exhausted, you will now have hours into your sleep before you're reaching the quality that's gonna create restorative feelings the next day. So we see why it's not just like, oh, blue light's bad. We've all heard about that. But when you really understand what it's doing to your brain, you're like, oh, I'm just like really messing with my body's clock. No wonder I don't feel so well rested in the morning. Yeah. Oh gosh, that's amazing. And I did, I knew that um, actually, and I try really hard. Like I, I'll read at night. That's my thing is I read, I'll journal before bed and then I read and that's how I shut it off. But um. Okay. So I'm curious, I would love to talk a little bit about sleep's effect on anxiety. And I know we need to to wrap up pretty soon because we're, I could talk about this stuff forever and there's so many details, but I think, I think it's so powerful and so important, but let's just talk a little bit about, um, sleep and mental health mm-hmm. specifically like sleep and anxiety. Cause I think as entrepreneurs, we tend to experience a higher level of anxiety, um, just with all the pressures and especially if we're solopreneurs. So, or have only a small team, or if we have a big team, then we're responsible for all these people. So there's so many levels of, of stress and anxiety that can, um, accumulate when as entrepreneurs. So let's talk about that. Yeah. I, you hit the nail on the head there with entrepreneurs experiencing that anxiety. And one of the most fascinating things that I've learned is that our ability to manage our emotional state happens 
during dreaming or what we like to call rapid eye movement, REM sleep, right? So during REM sleep, it is one of the only times that our body does not produce adrenaline and cortisol. It is therapy on your brain. And in a really good book, if you're like, this sleep stuff is interesting, is uh, Dr. Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep. It is fantastic. And in this book, he highlights this study in which um, there were two groups of people, one that was deprived of REM sleep and one that had adequate REM sleep. And they showed each group progressively negative photos. And the group that did not get enough dream sleep had much more severe reactions, both positively and negatively. So they naturally, their brains tended towards a negative emotional response. And on the other hand of things, they also swung much more into instant gratification and instant pleasure with dopamine. So they had less control over that pendulum swing in emotions, which made it very, it makes it very hard to respond, I think, with integrity in our business. I mean, if you've spent any time on TikTok recently or social media, you know that people have uh, a wide variety of opinions that they love to share, regardless mm -hmm. of if they're kind or not. So if you get one of those comments in your inbox or a client says, you know, we have a problem over here, I want to be able to stay calm and cool. But if I don't get enough REM sleep, I am much more likely to go into overwhelm, panic, and be responding in fear and anxiety instead of in like uh, capability and competence. Mm -hmm. So getting enough REM sleep allows you to maintain emotional control. And what I think of is almost like stay connected to the prefrontal cortex, your brain that makes decisions. So mm -hmm. while we may still experience anxiety, you are very aware at the same time that like, okay, this is anxiety. This is not who I am. This is just something I'm temporarily experiencing until this passes. Mm, I love that. Mm -hmm. This has been fabulous. So I'm going to ask one really quick last question. And that is, so you know how some people remember dreams and some people don't? What's, what's that about? Yeah. It's usually if you wake up in the middle of a dream or you finish it, progress to light sleep and then wake up. That's usually the difference. So, um, and I've only, um, known this, if you ever track your sleep with an aura ring or a Fitbit or any other device, you will see they have something called a hypnogram that'll show what stage your sleep is in based on a variety of factors that your device picks up. But if you are in dream sleep and you'll notice if you go right to awake time, that's most often when you'll remember your dreams. Oh, that's fascinating. That's a whole nother conversation, but listeners, I'm going to encourage you to go, um, Tanessa just did a podcast episode on the difference, uh, the differences between the or ring and the Fitbit. And yes. you, if you use either one of those, it's fascinating what information that you can get from those that you can gather about your own health. So Tanessa, we didn't even get to talk about biohacking in any depth, but I think we, we do know that sleep is the most important thing, diet, exercise, and then eliminating stress, keeping the cortisol levels down, um, are, are kind of the, the biohacking in a nutshell. So, um, thank you so much for being here. Will you tell the listeners a little bit about how they can reach you, connect with you, learn more from you, even work with you? Yeah. So the best place to find me is on Instagram. I'm at Tanessa Shears, T-A-N-E-S-S-A-S-H-E-A-R-S. -S -S -S. Um, on there, I'm always giving, you know, different hacks and tips and stuff like that. I'm more than happy to always respond to questions in the DMs in there. I love having conversations like that. Um, but beyond, if you're like, I really liked something that we talked about today, but you want a whole deep dive on it. My podcast, Becoming Limitless, is an episode on all the different biohacks and how they affect how you show up in your business. So it's very related to seeing that performance. So those are definitely great places to go to get lots of content and get a hold of me. If you're looking to optimize your brain, I'm your girl. <laughs> awesome. So I will put the links to all of that stuff in the show notes listeners. So you can go over to the show notes, just click through and everything will be there for you. So you can easily access all of that. And the other thing I want to remind you is that the purpose, well, actually, you know what? I'm not even going to do that reminder right now. I'm going to save that for later. Anyway, Tanessa, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Robin.